tonight. We welcome back for the third or fourth time. Is it fourth time? I think maybe it's four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, fourth time, uh, Dr. Shane Larson. Um, as some of you already know, uh, Dr. Larson is Research Associate Professor of Physics at Northwestern University, where he's the Associate Director of Sierra, which is the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics. He works in the field of gravitational wave astrophysics, specializing in the studies of compact stars, binaries, and the galaxy. Um, he uh, works in gravitational wave astronomy with both the ground-based LIGO product, project and the future space-based observatory, LISA, um, which he talked about at one of his previous programs, which is amazing. Um, he's an award-winning teacher and a fellow of the American Physical Society. He contributes regularly to a, a public science blog at writescience.wordpress.com. That's right science as in W-R-I-T-E science wordpress.com and he tweets with the handle at science jedi um, if you have any questions please submit them via chat and dr larson will be happy to answer them when he's finished his presentation and um if you have a if you have a smart tv you might want to plug your laptop into it so you can see the presentation more clearly normally we put his presentations on the biggest screen we have and everyone's sort of like Wow. Um, so uh, you, you might enjoy the presentation that way if, if you have the capability to do it. Um, well, uh, welcome everyone again and um, a special welcome to Dr. Shane Larson, who um, is always a treat. Thanks for being here, Dr. Larson. Thanks for the invitation, Grace. So uh, I'll go ahead and start actually with what uh, many of you have heard uh, in the news, which is there has been some interesting uh, discoveries made very close to home that are related to life in the universe. And it has to do with what you see in the background here. This is our closest neighbor in the solar system. This is Venus. So Venus is uh, notable in that it um, is very similar to Earth in terms of size and in terms of its overall mass. So if you could like stand on the surface, the gravity on Venus would feel uh, very normal. But it has always been an enigma to us, uh, especially since the beginning of the telescopic age, because we could never see anything on its surface. And the reason uh, for that we didn't discover until the 20th century is Venus is completely covered in clouds. And so what you see here, this big V structure in the uh, surface clouds is the winds wrapping the clouds around the planet is completely shrouded. Um, and that has uh, everything to do with the conditions on Venus. Venus has experienced a runaway greenhouse effect, and so the surface of Venus is everywhere something like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very inhospitable to life as we know it here on Earth. And so we've always kind of discounted Venus as being uh, a place where we should look for life when we go looking for life in the universe. And as it turns out, uh, a recent observation of Venus using telescopes has detected a molecule in the atmosphere called phosphine. So those of you who remember chemistry, you go looking up chemistry, phosphine is uh, phosphate plus three hydrogens. Um, it's kind of shaped like a three-legged three stool with the hydrogens on the bottom and the phosphate at the top where the seed of the stool is. And what's interesting about that is that it's, uh, it's a molecule that on Earth um, is very difficult to make because the conditions on Earth are not readily suited for it. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, but it is a product in some biological systems. And so we've seen phosphine in other places in the universe, Jupiter, Saturn, places like that. But the fact that it's on Venus and in the cloud structure of Venus, and we think it's coming from a uh, area high up in the clouds where it's a little bit cooler than it is on the surface, is very intriguing. Um, and so uh, if you've been reading the news, people are all about this is what we call a biosignature. Maybe it was generated by life. And so if that were true, the question is, well, what kind of life could be generating it? Uh, but as an astronomer, I think my, uh, my uh, answer for all the questions about this is we're still cautious, right? This is an interesting and unexpected result about Venus. Um, it could, in principle, be a biosignature for life because everything that we know about Venus, we don't know of any process that could, could create the phosphine otherwise. So maybe there's unknown life that's creating phosphine. That's the reasoning that we're using. 
But the truth is we don't know a lot about Venus because it's so inhospitable that the only probes we've ever landed on the surface of Venus have only lasted for you know, a half an hour or less. And they've all been Soviet probes. They landed, there are pictures from the surface, but then they melted basically and died. So we know very, very little about the surface chemistry, the first uh, surface geology. And so it's unclear whether or not there is processes, natural processes, not related to life, which might create that phosphine. And so our job now as scientists is to think about that and think about it hard. Um, there almost certainly are gonna be many more studies of Venus, but we're very interested in answering this question because one of the ways that we think about looking for life elsewhere in the universe on exoplanets, and if we talk about exoplanets in some future talk, I'll come back to this, um, is to look for signatures of life in the atmosphere, these biomarkers. And so what's intriguing about seeing the biomarkers in Venus is atmosphere is we can see them just like we might see them around a planet around another star. But unlike other stars, we can actually go test out what's causing it on Venus and find out whether or not the bio, uh, biomarker is a good marker or not. And so that's what has all of us who study astronomy very interested is this is a way to, as we say, ground truth our observations. We make our observations and most of the universe we have to infer what it means because we can't actually go there and check it out up close. But for places here in the solar system, especially a place like Venus, which is very close to us, uh, we can make our observations with our telescopes and then actually go there to see what it means. Okay, so this is the exciting news uh, and uh, we won't really touch on this in the talk today, but I wanted to mention it in case you've seen it and you can certainly go read about it. There's been a lot of coverage of this. Uh, in the newspapers and in blog posts. And so if you have questions, uh, we can certainly come back to this uh, in the future. Okay? So with that, I'm gonna go back to uh, my slides, back to, I'm gonna start my okay. slide. There we go. Um, okay, so what we're gonna talk about, the funny thing is Grace and I chose this uh, topic long, long ago. And so we secretly knew there would be big news about life in the universe. And so that's why we picked this topic. Um, and so we'll, we'll endeavor to always have uh, timely topics in the future. But we are going to talk about searching for life in the cosmos. And this has been a long-standing endeavor um, in astronomy um, from a variety of viewpoints. And it's probably one of not only the hardest problems in astronomy um, for a variety of reasons, but it's also one of the ones that I think intuitively to most of us is very interesting. And that's because we recognize that Earth, as far as we know, in all the places that we've seen, is unique in that it has life. And so the question of whether or not life is out there is kind of one of these big melt your brain kind of questions. And so it naturally captures people's attention and it's suitable for both hardcore scientific uh, experiments and thinking, but it's also suitable for, you know, kind of starry eyed, blue sky uh, dreaming and question asking while you're hanging out around the barbecue on Saturday as well. So this is what we're going to talk about in uh, specifically about uh, finding intelligent life by the time we get to the end. Um, as Grace said, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll answer questions at the end. Um, if two weeks from now you suddenly have some new question uh, and you can't find the answer to it, uh, my email address is there. You're certainly welcome to email me and uh, I will endeavor my best to provide you an answer or point you towards some resources. Uh, there's links there to my social media as well as to my uh, blog uh, where I've written a little bit about some of this stuff there as well. Okay, so let's talk about the big picture to start with. So to start with, I always start here, right? The universe is a really, really big place. And this picture is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's probably one of the most impressive pictures that humans have ever taken. If you take a dime and you hold it out at uh, arm's length, the size of this picture on the sky is only about the size of Roosevelt's eye. But in this picture, there are many thousands and thousands of galaxies. If we take the entire sky and multiply the number of Roosevelt eyes that might cover the sky, we think there will be something like 500 billion galaxies in the entire universe. Now, all of those galaxies are very much like the Milky Way. That's not an unreasonable assumption. There are some that aren't, but by and large, on average, they're going to be very similar. And so if I multiply all those galaxies by the number of stars in the Milky Way, there are a hundred billion trillion stars 
in the entire universe. And as we're learning, just in the last 10 or 20 years, every star has its own family of planets. Our own star has on order of 10 planets. And so there are a trillion, trillion worlds in all of the cosmos. Those numbers are enormous. That's count to a trillion a trillion times. Okay, it's mind-bogglingly large. Numbers that you and I never encounter in our everyday lives. But despite that enormous number of worlds in the entire universe, this world is the only world that we know with certainty that there is life. This, of course, is home. And it is a place where we're very used to and very accustomed to and don't think about the fact that life surrounds us. But step just 60 miles over our head and you're in outer space and beyond the boundaries of this small planet, there is no life that we know of anywhere. And so that, that kind of dichotomous cognitive dissonance is very succinctly captured by a very famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke, which I like a lot, which is this. Two possibilities exist. Either we're alone in the universe or we're not. And both possibilities are equally terrifying. Okay, and that, that idea I think very succinctly captures how many astronomers feel about the answers to this question about whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. So keep that quote in mind. We're gonna come back to another very similar quote at the end uh, and we'll talk about it uh, to close out the talk. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start with just talking about our speculations about what life might be like. Um, and then we'll talk about the search for intelligent life, what we call SETI. Um, and then we'll talk about communicating with extraterrestrial intelligence if it's there. So that often is called SETI. And in older books, if you look at it, it'll called SETI. Um, in more modern books, it's often called METI with an M which stands for, instead of communication with extraterrestrial intelligences, that's messaging extraterrestrial intelligences. So if you're looking for modern books on that, you'll, you should look for the word METI, okay? Now, as you might imagine, this topic, we could talk about this topic every day for a year, and we wouldn't cover all the things that we might talk about. And so I'm just going to go right over the top and talk about some of the things that I think are interesting. Hopefully, they provide some um, key points for you to go think about to ask questions about, to talk to your family about, to start your own uh, reading and education about. Some very specific things that I'm not planning on talking about. I'm not talking about settling on other worlds. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about starship travel. I'm not gonna talk about exoplanets per se. Um, those are all entire talks into themselves. Um, and if there is intense interest in this, then you can lobby Grace and the next time I come to the library, uh, we can talk about one of those, okay? So let's talk about what life might be like. So the beginning of studying life on other worlds or looking for life on other worlds is really understanding life here on Earth. And as humans, we're very life-centric, right? When we think about Earth and life on Earth, we think about us. Okay, now this obviously is a picture from the before time, before the pandemic, when we were all living at home and socially distanced. But there was a time when we could all gather together. This is uh, the beach down there uh, uh, on the lakefront in central Chicago, right off of Oak Street. And so when I show this picture, what I usually start with um, is, you know, this is like most urban beaches. It's very crowded, but it really kind of points to the fact that there are a lot of humans on the planet Earth. And when I was a kid, the number was much smaller. The number of humans on the Earth has doubled in my lifetime. And today, there are some 700 billion humans on the planet Earth. Now, that number is a big number. It's a number far outside any of our personal experiences, unless there happen to be a couple billionaires in the crowd tonight listening. Uh, but billion is a big number. But even despite that number, there are a lot of humans and you can already see it in this picture, there are a lot of other life forms that share the planet with us. And we're all familiar with those life forms. You've looked around in your backyard or in your park, or you've played games with your kids or your nephews about it, right? And there is a multitude of different life forms in all forms and varieties. 
Some of them are very common, like oak trees and daisies. Some of them are less common, but familiar, like squirrels and dragonflies. But then there are also some very odd and strange life forms on the planets, like platypuses, slime molds, and anglerfish, right? What's that anglerfish thing? Right? Looks like an alien right there, doesn't it? Right? So life is very, very diverse on the planet Earth. And in fact, every year, biologists add to the long list of known unique life forms on the planet Earth. The, the, the list of known species grows by tens of thousands every single year because the Earth is vast and life has filled every small corner of it and we don't know what all of it actually is. Now, despite that fact, despite the enormous diversity and the enormous differences that you see uh, when you look at all the life that even you and I, not being biologists, can name, there is one remarkable fact about life on Earth. And that is, while it looks very different at this level, at the macroscopic level, when you go to the micromolecular level, the level where all the molecular machinery of life works, we are all exactly the same. Every life form in this picture and every known life form on planet Earth shares the same molecular code, the same building blocks that build all the enormous diversity of life that we see on the planet. And that master molecule is what we call DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the thing that's in the center of all your cells in the nucleus that encodes all the instructions for building you. But if I look at the DNA for a frog or an oak tree or a piece of moss or a squirrel, any life form you want, the DNA sequence is different. The letters that they use are put in different orders, but the letters that they use are all exactly the same. The analogy I like to use here is with the library. If you go into the Glencoe Public Library, which you probably can't do right now, but when you've been there, you can pick up any book and they're all say completely different things, but they're all written in the same 26 letters of the Latinized English alphabet. DNA is the same thing. There's four letters, A, C, G, and T, and you put them in different orders and they make every life form on earth. That fact, the very first uh, hint of this, was discovered by Rosalind Franklin. Uh, Rosalind Franklin is uh, unknown, less known than she should be. Um, those of us here in the Chicagoland and Wisconsin area maybe know her a little bit better. There's a nearby university named after her. But she was the first person with her graduate student, Raymond Gosling, to take a picture of DNA and show us what the molecular structure of it looked like. And this is that picture over here on the right. It's a very famous picture called Photo 51. Uh, those of you who are theater goers may know there is a very excellent play about Rosalind Franklin and this uh, picture uh, uh, that was produced in the last five years or so. Uh, it's a very good play. I highly recommend it if you ever get the chance to see it. The picture is infamous because at a very critical time in their speculations, it was shown to Watson and Crick. And Watson and Crick are the ones who first uh, proposed the genetic code and that the sequencing of the genetic code would actually be uh, a way to describe individualized organisms. But it was actually this picture, Photo 51, uh, that they saw that enabled them to kind of close that loop in their mind and actually come up with uh, the, the beginnings of what today we call genetics. But it all started with Rosalind Franklin. And so it's, this, this point is really important. It's only 70 years since this picture was taken, that we've actually understood that the master molecule of all life on Earth is DNA. That's how youthful our knowledge about life really is. And this is really ultimately the problem with looking for life elsewhere in the universe. Our understanding of life on Earth is really very tenuous. We're kind of in that state where we know life when we see it, so we can definitely look at a chipmunk and say, that's alive. And I can definitely look at a spider plant and say, that's alive. But every now and then, there are things that we don't really understand. And we can't decide if they're alive or not. And that uncertainty in what do we actually mean when we define life causes trouble for us when we start imagining trying to look for life on other worlds. 
Okay, so to get at that point, let's talk about a very prevalent life form here on Earth, which are the microbes, okay? Now we started this talk by saying there are seven billion humans on Earth. And if I were uh, there with you in person, I would ask uh, for you to guess or to tell me if you know how many microbes there are on Earth. The answer is a lot more microbes than there are humans, okay? So there are, five million trillion trillion microbes, approximately, on the planet Earth. If you could take all of those microbes and sweep them up into a pile and put them on your bathroom scale, they would weigh 20 billion tons. That's 20 times the mass of the entire human race. So in terms not just of number, but in terms of total biomass on the planet, the microbes are the dominant life form on planet Earth. And that realization is really what has transformed our thinking about looking for life elsewhere on the cosmos, is that if they're the most prevalent thing on Earth, maybe they're the most prevalent thing elsewhere in the universe as well. The other thing that's transformed our thinking about looking for life in the universe is the recognition that the microbes, not only are they numerous, but they're extraordinarily adaptable, okay? So this picture is a picture of one of my favorite places on Earth. Uh, those of you who have been to Yellowstone will recognize it as the Grand Prismatic Spring. It's the largest hot spring feature in Yellowstone. There in the lower uh, left corner, you can see the boardwalk with people on it to give you a sense of the scale. So when you're walking near the Grand Prismatic Spring, you can't see this picture. This is really a picture you can only get from above. Uh, but it has this very beautiful, interesting rainbow structure. And so the reason it has rainbow structure is that in the very center of the pool, where the water from the geothermal feature is coming up out of the earth at boiling temperatures, it's very, very hot. As the water spreads out towards the edges, it gets progressively cooler, okay? So if you look at the pool, you will see different colored rings, okay? You'll see that kind of aqua colored ring, that kind of uh, yellowish ring, the kind of orangish rust ring, the really orange ring, and then the, the brown ring beyond. And the, what's causing those colors is different species of algae. And every species of algae is only tolerant to certain temperatures, and so they only grow in those very narrow regions in the Grand Prismatic Spring where the water has cooled to the temperatures that they like and that they need to survive and grow. And that's what gives the pool this very beautiful uh, rainbow-like structure, okay? This type of life uh, activity is what we, uh, has led to the study of a group of life forms, almost all of them microbes, that we call extremophiles. So extremophiles are life forms that thrive in environments that you and I would regard as extreme. So here in Yellowstone, the extreme uh, environment is super hot temperatures. You and I could not possibly survive except, you know, maybe out in the outermost rust range where it's, you know, kind of bath water temperature. But in the center of the pool, you and I would certainly die, but there's algae that can certainly grow there. We have discovered everywhere on earth in every extreme environment you can imagine, high salt environments, high temperature environments, low temperature environments, highly acidic environments, every extreme environment that we have looked in, we have discovered life has found a way to survive, okay? And so this also has given us great hope that if there is lots of microbial life out in the universe, that maybe it has found its uh, ability to be as adaptable as it here on Earth, and that it is filling a very extreme niches on other worlds elsewhere in the universe, and so maybe life is prevalent, okay? So this is what the current real forefront in astrobiology is really centered on. Thinking about what life might be like, if it is microbial, how might it survive in different environments, how does it gain energy, how does it propagate, how would we go looking for it? And that phosphine signature on Venus is an example of a biosignature from microbial life, that, uh, and so that's why people are very interested in it um, uh, with the new Venus result, okay? Now, 
all of us probably have thought about uh, life in the universe at some point. And certainly if you're like me, you spend a lot of time lurking in the science fiction stacks at the library. And when I think about life in the universe, I don't think about this life because I'm thinking about science fiction life. I'm thinking about life that looks like us. If you go through all of the movies in science fiction, there are a few that don't, don't uh, agree with this rule, but most of the movies in science fiction, the life forms look somewhat like us. Okay, now part of that is the difficulty that Hollywood has with making life forms. You used to have to put someone like me in a suit and, you know, maybe my day job is being the wildcat at Northwestern football games, but my weekend job is being a dressed up alien at the movie theater. Okay, and so the aliens that Hollywood has imagined naturally look like humans because there's a human inside uh, the suit. Now, computers give us the ability to make very different aliens, and there certainly have been extraordinarily attempts uh, to imagine aliens different. So the Horda up there in the top center, uh, all the Trekkers in the audience will recognize as being from the classic Star Trek. Um, but nonetheless, imagining what life might be like is very hard for us. We're very biased towards life on Earth. We think eyes and mouths and hands are so useful that we can't possibly imagine how other life in the universe might not have similar structure and function. But the truth is there's no real reason they would have to. And there have certainly been attempts to imagine life that is not that way. Uh, and I include the platypus here because I'm really not convinced they're from Earth. Maybe they're aliens and they're on Earth. Okay? So what about this sort of life, right? How are we going to find, or how are we going to look for life that is more similar to us than all the microbes? And usually what we're imagining when we're thinking about that is the science fiction imagining of life. Life not only that we recognize as being big and mobile and uh, you know, possibly similar in appearance to us, but life that is intelligent and is also searching the universe for life that looks like it and maybe wants to communicate with life elsewhere in the universe. And so very often our imaginings, our scientific imaginings about intelligent life or macroscopic, similar to us life in the universe, starts there, imagining what the communication problem might be like. So the first person to think about that was radio astronomer Frank Drake. Uh, so Frank uh, was doing this, in, he was thinking about this in the 1950s he, when he was a very young scientist. He's in his 80s now. Um, and so he was one of the first scientists to work at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, which was built in West Virginia. Uh, this telescope uh, here behind him is one of the very first telescopes that he used. And he conceived of a project early on in the, uh, his studies there uh, called Project Ozma. And what Cosmic Ozma's game was, was to search the heavens for possible radio signals from some extraterrestrial civilization, okay? Now, Frank did not detect any signals that he thought were of extraterrestrial origin, but he proved how the search might be done and he showed what we might look for. And this got the scientific community thinking about it. And so they had a conference at uh, the Radio Astronomy Observatory there in West Virginia. And if you go visit the NRAO, you can go visit where they had this conference. And hanging on the wall there in the conference room is probably the most famous equation in astrobiology. It's called the Drake Equation after Frank because he discovered when he put the conference together that if he kind of described each talk in the conference by a number, if you multiplied those numbers together, no advanced math here, just multiplication, they would predict for you or make our best estimate for you of what the number of intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way might be. So I'm going to use the Drake equation here to talk to us about what the likelihood is that we might not be alone in the Milky Way, that there might be some other species out there that we could talk to over our radio telescopes, okay? So this is the famous Drake equation. As I said, it's just seven numbers over there on the uh, right-hand side. And on the left side of the equal sign is the number N, okay? And each one of these numbers represents something very specific that we as astronomers can measure about the universe, 
a number that you can look up. In Frank's day, we didn't know the values to all of these numbers, but many of them now, you can get your astronomy book off the shelf or go get a general astronomy book from the library and look this number up because astronomers' ability to measure these numbers and our understanding of what these numbers mean has really grown. If you multiply those seven numbers together, on the left-hand side comes n, the number of civilizations we could talk to. So let's go through these numbers and talk about what astronomers know about them. So I'm gonna break this apart into two groups. So the first group is the first three numbers, okay? Now these three numbers, we've only been able to have values for literally in the last decade. The first number, our star, is the number of stars per year that are born in the Milky Way. Okay, so that is enabled by simply mapping the Milky Way to the best of our ability and counting the number of young stars and counting the number of old stars and looking where stars are born. And as telescopes get more powerful and surveys become more extensive, we measure this number better and better. That number is somewhere between five and six. Most of us think it's around six. The number there in the middle is the fraction of stars that have planets. Now, when I got my PhD, we had no idea what this number was. The only star that we knew with certainty that had planets was the sun. But today, we have launched several missions, the recently completed Kepler mission and the currently ongoing TESS mission have surveyed thousands and thousands of stars. And we have found that almost every star we look at actually has planets orbiting it. Now, most astronomers would probably assume that number is closer to one than a half, but in the interest of being conservative, of not making our guesses too big and fooling ourselves, I'm gonna take the number to be a half, but almost certainly it's bigger than that, okay? So that's, you take all the stars in the universe and that's the fraction of them that have planets. So one out of every two stars we're going to assume have planets. The last number there um, is usually called NE. And I've kept the, the notation NE for this talk. That's often in old papers uh, described to be the number of Earth-like planets in the solar system or in the stellar system. Um, the, the kind of better nomenclature for that is the number of habitable planets, because as we were just discussing, we've discovered that life can survive in very extreme environments. So the planet does not have to be Earth-like for there to be life on it. So in kind of more modern treatments, you'll often see this labeled H or NH for the number of habitable worlds. Um, in our own solar system, this number is arguable. If you're just looking at planets, it's either two or three, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Uh, Venus certainly can't uh, support life as we know it because it's too hot. Mars is just a little bit too far away from the sun and a little bit too small uh, to be strong enough to keep an atmosphere, or at least a dense atmosphere, and so our, Mars sometimes isn't included. But some astronomers will take this to be three, um, and so again, to be conservative and to make our math easy, uh, I'm gonna take it to be two. The real debate for this number comes if you want to start including things like moons around other worlds, and as some of you may know, there are very interesting moons around Jupiter and Saturn, which might be places where life might exist, and they certainly are not included in that number. So if I take those three numbers and I multiply them together, that's six, okay? The last four numbers, those are the hard ones, okay? Those are the ones about which we know almost nothing. And the reason we know almost nothing is because they're all about life itself, and Earth is the only example of life we have. So all of our prejudices about life come from the fact that when you look at Earth, you see lots of life, and we know a lot about life, but we have no idea whether or not life is common elsewhere in the universe. We can argue and convince ourselves one way or another that any of these numbers should be huge or any of these numbers should be small. And so there's basically two camps of astronomers. One camp, and I won't tell you which camp I'm in, but you'll eventually figure it out. One camp believes in what we call the principle of mediocrity. The principle of mediocrity is the ultimate extension of the Copernican hypothesis. Basically, the ultimate extension of the idea is there's nothing special about the Earth. And if there's nothing special about the Earth, it is not a fluke that life's here. 
what caused life on Earth almost certainly happens elsewhere. And so Earth's just a mediocre example of what life might be like. There must be lots of life elsewhere. The other camp of astronomers uh, adhered to something called the rare Earth hypothesis. That camp of astronomers says, you know, you know, life is really hard to make. And even though it had billions of years to get into the state that it's in, uh, maybe it was just a complete fluke that it started at all. Even though there's lots of chemicals that lead to life, the processes that make life are really complicated. And so maybe Earth is really rare. Maybe we're the only place where there's life or one of the few places where there's life, okay? And so how you choose the next four numbers puts you in that camp of the principle of mediocrity or of the rare earth hypothesis, okay? So let's talk about those numbers. So the first number is called FL. That is, of all the planets that exist in the galaxy, what fraction of them does life actually develop on? Now, if you believe in the principle of mediocrity, you believe that that fraction is really high. And the people who um, uh, make this argument um, basically point to two things. Basically, on the, the micromolecular scale, the building blocks of life on Earth, amino acids, proteins, all of that stuff, those kinds of organic molecules are seen everywhere. They are not unique to Earth at all. So that's the first argument they make. And the second argument is that if you look at the fossil record, the simplest life forms on Earth arose very soon after the Earth formed, which also suggests it's not hard to get life going. And so people who believe in the principle of mediocrity would take the fraction of planets that have life on it to be very large. Um, I would like to be conservative maybe not as conservative as the rare earth uh, hypothesis people. Um, so I'm going to just say out of, if I just take 100 planets from all the known planets, maybe only one in 100 of them uh, form life. And that number is kind of consistent with all the worlds in the solar system. If you were to add up all the moons and all the planets in the solar system that might harbor life of one sort or another, one per hundred would say earth is it. Okay, it's a little bit more conservative than that, but it's a, it's a close number. Okay, the second number is of all the planets that do develop life, how many of them develop intelligent life, right? And, and this also is a difficult question. Not only is it difficult to recognize life itself, it's difficult to recognize intelligence. Okay, so my, my thing here is a chipmunk because chipmunks are clearly not as smart as you and I are at least by our definition of smart. But chipmunks, one could argue, are pretty intelligent, right? They spend all summer grabbing food, nuts, acorns, whatever it is chipmunks eat, and putting them in their burrows. And the reason they do that is because they know when winter gets here, they're going to go into this semi-hibernation state called topor, where they are kind of hibernating, but not fully hibernating like a bear does. Uh, but when they're kind of groggy and awake, they have to eat something to sustain them through the winter. They're basically preparing for the future. One could argue that's a trait of intelligence. Um, clearly, uh, 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 there are bird species that are intelligent. So we have documented evidence of ravens and crows carrying sticks around and taking the sticks and dipping them in holes and pulling them out and then eating all the bugs that hold on to the stick they basically use a stick as a tool, right? Dolphins and whales communicate with each other, right? They're clearly intelligent. Not intelligent in the same way you and I are, but intelligent by any standard of intelligence that you might want to, want to imagine, okay? So on Earth, we have this difficulty. There's lots of evidence for intelligence, but there's also lots of non-intelligent life. The grass in the background there is not intelligent. Okay, trees we don't think are intelligent. Um, algae we don't think is intelligent. Okay, so the question is, is if you do develop life, maybe you develop lots of microbes and lots of algae, how much, what fraction of all those plants with life develop intelligence? So again, in the interest of being conservative, I'm gonna take that number to be one per hundred. Okay, now our goal here is to think about alien species, alien civilizations we could talk to. 
So this number is the fraction of civilizations that are communicative. The fraction of civilizations that develop radio telescope technology. Okay, so on Earth, there's only one species that's done that. If the dolphins have radio telescopes, they've hidden them from us very well. Okay, as far as we know, the, the humans are the only species that has developed radio technology. It's not clear we're going to be the only species by which that happens. There's great science fiction about that. Uh, you should read uh, Cliff Simak wrote this very famous book in, in the 60s called City about dogs inheriting human civilization after, after humans are gone and they have technology just like we do. Uh, if you go to the biology journals, we uh, see in the uh, uh, rainforest uh, chimpanzee tribes that have entered the Stone Age. That is, they take stone, they fashion tools out of them, they conserve those tools and use them over and over again. So clearly there are species that are on their way to having more advanced technology. But right now, only humans have radio technology. So again, in the interest of being conservative, we're gonna take this number to be of all the planets with life, we take only the planets that have intelligent life, and of those few planets that have intelligent life, let's say only one in a hundred of those develops radio telescope technology, the ability to make or listen for phone calls. Okay? Now, here's the big one. The big one is if a civilization reaches that state where they have the technology to communicate, how long do they survive? And this is a question that is very much on all of our minds right now. We have entered a state when I was growing up, as many of you, it was the Cold War. We had developed the dubious technology to destroy ourselves via nuclear warfare. That technology still exists and it is still very much a threat. But of course, there are other existential threats uh, concerning us today, not the least of which is the climate. Uh, the climate is shifting dramatically, largely due to human activity. Uh, we see it in the uh, geologic record, uh, and we see its influences happening all around us. And so the question is whether or not our civilization will survive these kinds of existential threats. Um, the number there, L equal 5,000 year, uh, is a number I've picked because if you look at uh, when the human civilization began and the long history of its civilization, that is the current number we have, okay? There are astrobiologists who think that number should be 100 because basically that's how long we've had radio telescopes. So we only know that technological civilizations can last at least 100 years. But if you just regard technology in general, and in particular agricultural technology, which is what really enables our civilization, that goes back to ancient Mesopotamia. And so that's about a 5,000 year history, okay? So the last number is the lifetime of the civilization, which I'm gonna to take to be 5,000 years. So if I take all those seven numbers and I multiply them together, there's the six there at the top from the first three astronomy numbers. And there's the four numbers together that we just discussed. And if I multiply them together, I get 0 0.03. That number is less than one, which means in all the Milky Way galaxy, it's very possible that we are the only communicating civilization there is. We could be very, very alone. Now, I didn't even try and convince myself that these numbers should be small. I said we were being conservative, okay, but I didn't try and go as extreme as uh, the camp that believes in the principle of mediocrity. And so the question is, is if I look at these numbers, is there anything that's really wiggle room here, okay? And the fact is those first three numbers, the first three red numbers, F, I, F, C, F, L, the ones that I said I'm being conservative about and I'm taking a guess at, we have absolutely no idea what they should be. But the last number, L, is a number that we actually know. The value I've used there is the number for humans. But we know that the dinosaurs survived on the planet for 170 million years before the universe snuffed them out. An asteroid strike in the Yucatan killed the dinosaurs 
uh, in something that we call the KT extinction event. Okay, but they lived on this planet for 170 million years before that happened. Now, they didn't develop radio telescopes, but if we survived for as long as the dinosaurs survived, this is the number I should use in the Drake equation. And since Bruce Willis is still alive and can you know, save us from asteroids, it's very likely we might survive for 170 million years. So let's change that number to 170 million instead of 5,000. And if I then multiply it out, I get 1,000 possible civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. And that means we're not alone. There could be a thousand other civilizations out there as intelligent and as capable as we are looking around them and wondering whether or not they're alone and perhaps sending messages or listening for messages that tell them that they're not alone in the galaxy. Okay. So that is not even all the way on the side of the, uh, the principle of mediocrity. Um, so if you look at those three numbers at the top there, the 0.01s, the ones per hundreds, those are the numbers where the most arguments come about. But in the end, this L number here, how long does a civilization exist, either before it distinguishes itself or before the universe extinguishes it, is the number that really affects what this number overall is, okay? But there's one interesting extension to this, okay? And that is, you and I both know that talking on the phone is overrated. Yeah, I know it's the thing that people do, and right now, since we're all living at home alone, we love talking on the phone, okay? The kids, all they ever do is talk on their phone. But what if I actually didn't care about talking on the phone? What if all I wanted to know is whether or not life was common? And not just common, but life at least as complicated as the dinosaurs, okay? If I do that and I go back to the Drake equation, then two of these numbers don't matter at all. If I don't care if life is intelligent and I don't care if it builds radio telescopes, I knock those two equations out of the Drake equation. And then there's only five numbers. The three that we know really well, the one that estimates the fraction of planets that life might survive on, and how long those civilizations might live. So if I keep my one per hundred and I put in the lifetime of the uh, dinosaurs, then this now tells me the number of planets in the Milky Way that has life at least as complicated as dinosaurs on it. And that number is 10 million. There may be 10 million planets in the Milky Way galaxy with life at least as complicated as dinosaurs on it. And that makes the 14 year old inside of me very, very happy, okay? Because having dinosaurs around would be very, very cool. Now, of course, most of us know the dinosaurs are still with us. They evolved into their descendants, the birds. Um, and who's to say that they didn't eventually become intelligence on one of those 10 million worlds out there in the universe. And maybe there are intelligent dinosaurs with their own space programs and their own radio telescopes. And maybe someday we will talk to Saurian uh, civilizations who are now plumbing the cosmos looking for life that looks a lot like them, okay? So that brings me to the last little bit of my talk, which is this. Could we send a message to one of those possible thousand civilizations out there, okay? And moreover, the inverse of that question is could they send us a message, okay? So let me tell you a little story about that. So, uh, the very first uh, uh, regular signal we discovered from uh, the stars was this signal, which was discovered in the 1960s uh, by Jocelyn Bell in 1967. And she saw this little regular series of blips that you see here in the lower trains. Blip, 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 blip. I mean, they were evenly spaced. And they were so evenly spaced that they called this signal originally LGM1 okay, for little green men, because they could not imagine any physical phenomena which created such a regular lighthouse-like signal over and over again in the radio spectrum, okay? 
Well, as it turns out, it's not little green men. It's actually a remarkable astrophysical phenomena called a pulsar. A pulsar is the remnant of a dead star that explodes in a supernova. There are other kinds of remnants, which you and I have talked about before, black holes and white dwarfs. But pulsars are another type. And so Jocelyn Bell was the very first person to discover one of these. And as it turns out, the universe is full of these pulsars. And so it makes it a little hard to look for signals that an intelligent uh, civilization might be sending us to try and convince us uh, that, um, uh, that they're out there. So let me, um, let me play that uh, in audio for you so you can hear what that signal sounds like. Okay, so I just took the signal and converted it into sound. It's a very regular pulse structure, and if you stretch it out, it'll sound like a heartbeat. But at the rate that it's coming, it's very fast, regular, regular. They're all the same height, okay? So we discovered pulsars with radio telescopes like this one. So this is the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. Uh, it has, for decades, been the largest telescope in the world. Uh, it was recently eclipsed by one in China called FAST, uh, but it's still in operation. It suffered some recent damage, but they're working on that. Uh, but we use this telescope to study pulsars, uh, and we use those pulsars for many different kinds of science, both studying stars, looking for gravitational waves, uh, but we also use Arecibo both to search for signals from extraterrestrials, and as it turns out, we used it once upon a time to send a signal that we hoped an alien civilization might detect. So let's talk about that. Oh, so this is what Arecibo looks like built out of Lego. Uh, some of you may know I'm a Lego fanatic, so I build these things out of Lego. So in 1974, Frank, together with many of his colleagues, imagined how you should construct a signal that an alien civilization might be able to decode. It was a message that consisted of 1,679 digits, it was sent to the globular cluster M13 in Hercules, which we can see here from the Northern Hemisphere uh, in a small telescope from your backyard, if you ever hear the chance. Okay, and that message looks like this. Okay, now I'll tell you what that message is all about in a minute. There's actually a message here. Okay, and the idea is, is that the message has been encoded mathematically. And if you're an alien civilization capable of building a radio telescope, that means you understand physics and science and math. And if you understand math, then you can understand the mathematical principles by which this message was encoded. Okay? Now, I played the pulsar signal for you. Let me play this signal for you to illustrate the difficulty in separating the two. Okay, so hopefully you heard that. It's not as regular as the, uh, as the uh, pulsar signal, but basically every place you see a one in this signal, we made some sound, and every place there's a zero, we didn't make a sound. That's like in the pulsar signal, we would put a one everywhere there's a spike and not put, uh, put a zero everywhere there's not a spike in that long trace signal that I showed you from Jocelyn, okay? So what's the deal with this message? Well, the point is this message is actually a picture. Okay, so every one of the numbers is a pixel in a picture. And the way you deconstruct the message is everywhere you see a zero, you leave it blank. And everywhere you see a one, you color in the pixel. And then if you arrange the numbers correctly, they form a picture. Okay, so as an example, here's a much simpler sequence of ones and zeros. Okay, there's nine digits here. So if I make that into a three by three square matrix, I put in the ones and zeros. I color in the ones and leave the zeros empty. You get an X. X marks the spot. Okay, now whether or not an alien would understand X marks the spot is irrelevant, but I'm trying to send a message to you so you understand the process here. And so that is very clearly, I hope, an X. Okay, so if you take those 1,679 digits from the Arecibo message, what you discover is that it's a very special kind of mathematical number. That 1,679, if you factor it, which is something they taught you to do long ago when you took your first math class, it factors only one way into two numbers. 
it factors into a 23 and a 73. And so that's supposed to tell you to put, whoops, it looks like I duplicated it there, sorry about that. Uh, it's supposed to tell you to make 73 columns and 23 rows or 23 columns and 73 rows. So here at the bottom, I've made 73 columns and 23 rows. I've colored in every one and left every zero blank. And as you can see, mm, it doesn't really look like a picture, okay? But if I make 23 columns and 73 rows, even before I color it in, you can see there that it looks like there's some structure in that message. And indeed there is. Let me color it in, okay? So this is called the Arecibo message. I've colored it in and it's shifted a little bit. I must have screwed something up. Hang on, let me recenter that there. Uh, okay, there so you can see the whole thing, okay? So all the coloring there, um, the message isn't colored itself. The color coding is for you so you know what's in the message, okay? So up at the very top in white is how to count to one and 10 in the message. Okay, so that's the first numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. The purple group of numbers are the numbers one, six, seven, eight, and 15. Those are the atomic numbers of the elements on the periodic table that make up the basic chemistry of life on Earth. The green uh, there below that are the chemical signatures written in terms of the numbers 1, 6, 7, 8, and 15 of the DNA nucleotides, the building blocks of the genetic rungs of the DNA ladder. The blue double helix is a graphical representation of DNA, and the column, uh, white column there in the middle is the number of base pairs in the human DNA strand. Just below the DNA and intersecting the DNA is the red stick figure, a representation of what humans look like. On the left is a ruler indicating the approximate size of the humans. And on the uh, right is the approximate population of Earth at the time the message was sent. So about three and a half billion in the mid 1970s. The yellow below the figure is a map of the solar system. Uh, at that time, Pluto was still a planet. So there's nine, nine planets there. And then the third planet is offset below the figure to indicate where the people sending the message were from. And below that is the Arecibo telescope with the size of the telescope written underneath it. So this message was sent to the stars. It is not in English. It is in mathematical terms. And the idea is, is that if you can understand the math, the prime numbers and the counting, then there is information in here that you can decode and try to understand. Now, ever since this message has been sent, uh, astronomers have debated a great deal about whether or not it could be misinterpreted, whether or not people might understand it. Um, and that is, of course, always questionable. Uh, but, uh, but there are those of us who believe that it should be, in fact, uh, decodable and at least understood in part by anyone who receives it, okay? So the last little thing I want to tell you about is to ask this question. Have we ever heard anything? Okay, and the answer to that right now is no. There is no definitive signal that we have ever identified coming from space that all of us unambiguously agree is a signal from an extraterrestrial civilization. But there have certainly been interesting candidates that we have seen, and so let me just tell you about one of them. So this is the Big Ear Radio Telescope that used to be on the grounds of the uh, University of Ohio. Uh, it is no longer there, but it's a giant radio telescope. Uh, the radio signals would come in from the sky and hit the right-hand uh, diagonal panel. It would reflect the radio beams to the curved panel on the left-hand side, which would then focus the radio beams to that little house there in the cement on the center of the picture, and that's where all the radio receiver equipment uh, was received, okay? And so uh, the radio telescope was operating uh, around the time it was first built in 1977, and there was a very prominent signal detected, which we call the wow signal. 
Now, the reason we call it the wow signal is because those of you who are old enough will remember in the olden days, computers didn't have uh, fancy graphic displays like the one you're watching this talk on. Uh, things were done on teletype uh, terminals. And so the telescope used to print out its signals on uh, tractor feed paper. And so the uh, astronomer watching the signal on that night in uh, 1977 saw that circled red sequence come out that was recognized because they had stared at so many of these signals for so often as being an odd signal. And they circled it and wrote the, the word wow next to it because it was so big and bright. Okay, so this is why this is called the wow signal. In kind of more modern parlance, if we were to do this on a uh, proper computer monitor today, we would just plot the signal. But you can see here, it looks like a very big spike. Now, as an astronomer, when I look at this picture, the thing I look at is both the, the size of the big, big spike there, but what I'm really looking at is those little parallel lines that are following the spike, okay? Those things that look like equal signs. Those are basically how loud the static is in the radio signal. Normally, when we're listening for radio signals, all we hear is static <laughs> all the time. But this signal, you can see, is 30 or 40 times louder than the background static. And so for those of you who listen to your radio when you're on a long road trip, it's like listening to a radio station that's really far away. There's kind of a little bit of background static, but you can still hear the tunes and rock along as you're driving along. That's what this is showing us. This signal was really loud and really obvious, and it was way louder than the static. And the most important thing about this signal is that it was, it was observed in 1977. And today, uh, 87, 97, 07, 17, more than 40 years later, we still have no explanation for what it was. Okay? And so, there's no natural phenomena we know that caused it. Uh, we haven't ever seen it repeated, but we, of course, haven't really looked for it very much. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you can imagine might have been sent out to attract your attention. Uh, maybe it was the termination of a message and we missed it at the beginning, right? Who knows? We have no idea what it is. And so this still is one of the things that those of us who think about uh, astrobiology and extraterrestrial intelligence that we think a lot about because maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Maybe the universe is just fooling us just like it was with the pulsars. Maybe this was some civilization trying to get our attention. Who knows? The future will tell. Okay? Okay, so that's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, as always, I have a few things if you want to go read and uh, learn about this more on your own. Uh, I'll start with a few books over here on the left. Um, they have all of these at the Glencoe Public Library. Uh, so The Eerie Silence is a book by Paul Davies, who some of you may know is a very famous uh, public science writer. Uh, the Eerie Silence is a really great book. It's primarily focused on SETI. Uh, so Paul was with the SETI Institute for a long, long time. Uh, and so it's a really great book if you're kind of interested in SETI. Uh, Five Billion Years of Solitude is a really fantastic book by Lee Billings. Uh, Lee is mostly talking about exoplanets, uh, so other planets where we might find life and which we're using currently to focus our search for life uh, in this kind of chemical signature way that the Venus results are in uh, elsewhere. And so if you're interested in exoplanets and the connection to life, that's a really good starting point. And of course, Contact is a novel uh, about what the search for life might be like. Uh, it's also a very great movie. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, uh, it's great with uh, Jodie Foster. Uh, and it has a lot of these kinds of questions and ideas about what would life be like and could we communicate with them and how hard would it be. Up there on the right, uh, Vlad the Astrophysicist is one of my favorite songs. It's by a folk artist from Wisconsin named Peter Mulvey. Uh, and if you go watch this on YouTube, it's really a fantastic song. Um, he has a friend called Vlad, who's an astrophysicist, who he asked this question about whether or not there was life elsewhere in the universe. And it is by far and away one of the most lucid and clear explanations about why we have or have not detected life in the universe. So I highly commend that to your attention. Uh, this book by Rachel Sussman is a public level coffee table book about the oldest living organisms on Earth. Um, I really like this book because it really uh, makes you contemplate all the things that we think about life and how life survives and what our ultimate fate might be and what the fate of all the other organisms uh, we use on the planet might be as well. Uh, 
Uh, the two, uh, two uh, links down there at the bottom, the top one is to a 10 minute, uh, a five minute version of this talk that uh, I just gave you uh, that I did for Ignite in Chicago. So Ignite's a very cool talk format, five minutes long, 20 slides, your slides auto advance every 15 seconds. So it's very hard to talk about science, but I basically did to talk about the Drake equation. Uh, and then the last link there, um, I taught an entire quarter course on astrobiology last quarter at Northwestern. And since that uh, course was taught during the pandemic, uh, all of my lectures are online. There's 52 lectures, they're about a half hour each. And so if you're interested in diving into this, you can certainly go watch all of my lectures. So that link is to the YouTube playlist with all my lectures. Okay, so I will leave you with the promised second version of the quote we opened with. This one is from uh, Buckminster Fuller. He said essentially the same thing as Arthur C. Clarke, but somewhat differently. He said, sometimes I think we're alone, Sometimes I think we're not, but in either case, the thought is staggering. And if I had to place myself on the spectrum uh, between Clark and Fuller, I like to think that I'm closer over here to Fuller because I think uh, the implications of whether or not we're alone um, are the thing that intrigue me the most about this question. Uh, mostly because in either case, whether you're a Clarkian or whether you're a Fullerian, whether you're a rare earth hypothesis, hypothesian or a principle of mediocrity in, uh, the real ultimate question is really for ourselves and how do we maintain uh, ourselves as life here on earth and as stewards of this planet. So I will say thank you there and I'm going to end now and I will pass it back to Grace so that we can have some questions if people have any questions. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. That was fairly mind-bending. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks that. Um, but we've got two questions um, in the Q&A section. Um, Harolyn wants to know, define what a galaxy really is. Okay, so that's a great question. So galaxies are actually what my group at Northwestern studies. So galaxies are the largest cohesive structures that we see in the universe. So they are bound together, that is they're held together by gravity. And what defines a galaxy is that it's almost uh, entirely comprised of stars. There's other stuff, there's gas and dust and planets and all of that. But the defining character of a galaxy is it's a gigantic collection of stars. So a galaxy like the Milky Way is about 400 billion-ish stars. Um, there are galaxies that are far larger than the Milky Way. There are galaxies that are far, far smaller than the Milky Way. But the Milky Way is, I would say, an average run-of-the-mill type of galaxy. Uh, if you go Google pictures of galaxies, galaxies like the Milky Way are called spiral galaxies. So they have these kind of very pretty wound up structures. They look like whirlpools in space. Um, so they're basically gigantic collections of stars. Thank you. Um, next question, why, why does the Vatican have a giant telescope in Arizona? Ah, so the Vatican has, yeah, so, so the Vatican has a very strong contingent of scientists who work with them. Uh, the Vatican Observatory is one of the oldest scientific institutions in Europe. Um, they ha used to have, uh, well, they must still have an observatory in Europe that they use, but the, the telescopes on the planet are in remote dark places and high on mountaintops because the Earth's atmosphere inhibits our ability to, um, to, to actually observe and, and study things that are far away. So that's why it's in Arizona, is because Arizona is still one of the darkest, driest places in the continental United States, um, and so they've placed their telescope there. Um, the Vatican Observatory, uh, there's a lot of very well-respected scientists. Those of you who pay attention to astronomy, uh, probably the most uh, famous of them is Brother Guy. Um, so Brother Guy is a very prominent astronomer, and he talks a lot about this sort of stuff uh, that, that you and I have been talking about tonight. So if you're interested in more talks about this kind of subject, um, and certainly want that viewpoint that comes from um, our colleagues in the Vatican Observatory, um, I highly commend your attention to Brother Guy's talks. And he comes to Chicago periodically. So if you pay attention, uh, he has colleagues here in Chicago. Uh, he does show up in Chicago and, and do talks periodically in Chicago. So definitely uh, go see him if you get the chance. He is an absolutely excellent speaker. And what was his name again? I couldn't quite catch that. Brother Guy Cosmolongo. Yeah. Brother Guy. 
Okay. Another guy, we okay. all know another guy, but, uh, and I probably can't spell his Italian last name off the top of my head. But if you Google Brother Guy Vatican Observatory, it'll pop him up. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, uh, if Ray, oh, <laughs> Nigel says, shouldn't we just stay quiet rather than advertising our presence? Yeah, so this is, this, is a big, this is a big question, and people often ask this, right? So, so, you know, the question is, is there a threat to us if we broadcast our existence here in the, in the galaxy? And, and I think most of us would argue the answer to that question is no, because the whole reason we're trying to communicate is because it's the fastest way to get any information between the stars. If we physically wanted to go between the stars, it is almost impossible by the laws of physics and any technological means that we can imagine to get from one star to the other. So we don't imagine that any civilization that might receive our signal would be a threat to us. Now, there are um, reasons that we have that kind of response and many of us many of us think that 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 kind of fear response is our innate biological brain trying to protect us against unknown threats right if i go outside in my backyard and sleep alone in the dark right now all i do all night is think maybe i shouldn't be out here advertising my presence to all these rabid possums and raccoons there around me right and and so this is the same kind of fear response that we think is going on but if we control that fear response and we think about the practicalities of what would it take for an alien civilization to actually threaten us we don't we don't think it's credible and a credible idea to imagine that they could come to earth and and destroy us it's certainly not any more of a threat to us than we already are to our, ourselves okay but you know i it's a worthwhile question and it's certainly a question for debate it's a question we absolutely should argue and think about because you know we're all in this game together and so you know whatever we do it happens to all of us so uh next question if radio, uh, Joel wants to know, if radio signals travel at the speed of light, won't it take a long time to get to the Hercules cluster? Yes, so that's an excellent question. So the Hercules cluster is 27,000 light years away, 24,000 light years away, something like that. So by the time that message is received, decoded and sent back, it will be 50,000 years from now. And I would guess that our civilization, if we live as long as the dinosaurs, will still be here, but the records of the fact that we even sent that message will be long lost. And so our descendants may not even remember that we sent a message out uh, to the Hercules cluster. And so this also is part of the big debate about why are we trying to communicate? Really, in, in, for all practical purposes, what we're doing is we're just broadcasting, hey, we're here, if you hear this message, you know, we had, we had a great time. We hope you're interested in all the things that we did, right? But, but the likelihood that, that we're close together and that we could carry on a conversation that's back and forth on the lifetime of a human is, is very remotely small. Uh, next question, Len wants to know, what do you think about the people who question the wisdom of sending messages like the Arecibo message, as it may not be in our interest to draw attention to ourselves? You know what, I think you just answer, answered that. Um, right, okay, S same sort of question. Um, Marcus wants to know, why is it so significant that phosphine was found on Venus when it's already been found on Jupiter and Saturn? Yeah, so, so the driving interest in Venus, um, so Jupiter and Saturn, we expect phosphine to be made because the processes uh, deep in the atmospheres of, of Saturn and Jupiter are conducive to the amount of energy needed to make phosphine. Now, Venus certainly has a lot of energy because of the runaway greenhouse effect. It's hot. But we, of all the things that we know about Venus, we don't know of any geochemical or atmospheric process that we know produces phosphine. And that's really, that's really the thing that has our attention right now, right? It may be that there's geologic processes we don't know. That's why we still have to investigate. But if we just tick off all the boxes of all the things that we know is going on, none of them lead to phosphine, okay? If you look at the atmospheric layer where the measurement was made, the temperature in that layer, it's very high above the surface of the planet. It's more temperate 
than the temperature at the surface of the planet. And so again, that triggers in our brain this prejudice we have for the conditions that life on Earth experience, namely temperatures that are, you know, reasonable, where by reasonable we mean temperatures that liquid water can survive at. And so, so these are the things that have kind of caught our attention. And, you know, traditionally, most of us who think about astrobiology, we don't think about all these biomarker, biomarker signatures, and we may not think about phosphine all the time. But the fact that we can't readily say, nope, that's because this phosphine rock, this phosphate rock is decaying with this acid process and becoming phosphine this way, right, means that we don't have any way to explain phosphine. And so that means all of the explanations for phosphine have to be on the table. And one of the explanations for phosphine might be the presence of life. Right. <laughs> Which would be awesome. <laughs> and, and, and the awesome thing about it is it's completely testable, right? If we saw this biosignature around an exoplanet, around a star that's 10 light years from Earth, we're never going to be able to verify it. But we can send a probe to Venus to verify what's causing the phosphine. We can send a probe to Venus to look for life. We can send a probe to Venus to teach us more about the atmosphere. We can send a probe to Venus to teach us more about the rocks and the geochemistry, right? That's, what, that's why this is really exciting because we have a unique opportunity to test this idea that one of the ways to look for life is to look for biosignatures. And resolving this question, where is the phosphine coming from on Venus, will teach us how easy is it to fool us into thinking there's life or not life. Uh, Marcus wants to know, um, no, sorry, that was Marcus. Um, Joe C. wants to know, um, which future missions will advance the search for life the most? Uh, so, so in terms of missions that are currently planned, um, almost all the missions that are aimed at direct detection of life in the solar system um, are going to Mars. Okay, so everything about the Mars program is about assessing the possibility of life on Mars. Now, there are other places in the solar system where life may very readily exist. Um, the most prominent one that you've probably heard about is Europa. So Europa is one of the uh, moons of Jupiter. It has a ice surface, but it has a ocean center. It has a liquid, liquid a subsurface liquid ocean. And so uh, because Jupiter is there providing energy to Europa and because there's water and we have this very distinct bias towards life needing water and we can see places on Earth that are as extreme as Europa, then we can imagine that maybe Europa is a haven for life. So there has been a lot of debate, uh, um, design debate, about how to design a mission that could go to Europa, uh, basically build a uh, drill of some sort that would either melt its way down through the ice and release a submarine that could swim in the subsurface ocean of Europa and look for the possible signatures of life. That's probably the other one that you've heard about. Um, this new result from Venus may drive interest in Venus substantially. So, you know, we'll see. But, uh, but, but in terms of its probes here on Earth, um, it's, all about, it's all about Mars almost exclusively. Around exoplanets, you will hear us building bigger and better telescopes for looking at exoplanets. And so in the distant future, NASA is considering building very, 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 very large telescopes in space. Uh, so there's a couple of them. Uh, probably the most prominent one is one called Louvoir. And those, those telescopes are designed not just to take a picture of a distant star, but to take a picture of a distant star where you can also see the planets, right? And that would allow us to do spectroscopy, that is to measure the molecules of the planets, which is exactly what we just did on Venus. But that mission, if it happens, I would guess is 20, maybe 30 years in the future. Next question from anonymous attendee. Um, will the black hole in the Milky Way eventually swallow all of the stars in it? So that's a great question. So uh, many of you may know that at the centers of big galaxies like the Milky Way, um, there is almost always a big black hole. And so there is a very uh, big one at the center of the Milky Way. It's called Sagittarius A star. It's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And so there are very definitely stars near the black hole at the Milky Way that are going to fall into the Milky Way. 
uh, sorry, they're going to fall into the black hole uh, at some point in their future, future life. But as you get farther and farther away from the black hole, um, the gravity that you feel isn't just from the black hole, it's also from all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, and so out where we live, we are far more influenced by the other 400 billion stars in the Milky Way because there's 400 billion times the gravity of the sun from all of those stars and only 4 million times the gravity of the sun from the black hole. So once you get out into the outer regions of the galaxy where you and I live, then it's really the stars that influence us. But if you have the misfortune of living down close, then absolutely the black hole has a very distinct possibility of sucking you in someday if you get too close. Well, that's a relief. <laughs> uh, next question from Phil. Uh, the other evening, while looking at Jupiter and Saturn, I saw what I believe were a pair of double stars moving at 90 degrees above my position, San, oh, San, San Antonio, Texas, um, from east to west around 11 p.m. Central Time. I'm assuming they were double stars moving parallel to each other. The only other thought I have is that perhaps they were a pair of satellites moving parallel to each other. In your experience, are there any pairs of satellites moving parallel to each other? Yeah, so if, if they were actually moving at a rate that you could observe, they're almost certainly satellites. Um, now, if you, uh, so there are many websites online that let you track satellites, so if you knew exactly the time you were out, because there's a lot of satellites, but if you knew exactly the time you were out and you knew exactly which constellation they were passed over, you could almost certainly uh, use one of those websites to find out what they are. Um, there are also software packages, both on your computer and on your phone. Uh, they're basically digital planetariums, and if you happen to have one of those when you're out and you hold it up, uh, your phone sensor will figure out what's behind it, and you can zoom in, and it should also tell you what the satellites are if you happen to see them. Uh, there are formations and constellations of satellites that fly around the Earth. Um, depending on what day it was uh, and how many weeks ago it was, like when Dragon decoupled from the space station, uh, you would see Dragon and space station flying across the sky together. Uh, so, so there's all kinds of possibilities for what it was. It all depends on, on what day it actually was. Uh, Tom would like to know, after COVID, recommendations regarding publicly accessible observatories. That was okay. what I was talking to yeah. you about, too. I talking about that at the beginning. So uh, at Northwestern, uh, the Dearborn Observatory is at Northwestern. And every Friday night that it's clear, we have public observing, Friday and Saturday night, I think, we have public observing. So if you go to um, this, uh, the website at Northwestern and just put uh, Dearborn Observatory into the search bar, it will bring up the observatory website and the schedule will be there. Um, on certain nights, you can reserve it for the first hour. So if you want to have a private party or uh, you know, bring your in-laws and all your cousins from out of town to look through the telescope, you can do that. Uh, but then the second hour is public observing. So um, that's every Friday and Saturday night that it's clear. Um, the Adler also has public observing, and so if you go to the Adler's website, uh, they will tell you they do uh, scopes in the city, so they often pop up around Chicago uh, and do observing. And then also there are uh, four or five major clubs here in the Chicagoland area, and most of those clubs also have public observing uh, star parties. Uh, they probably aren't doing them right now during COVID since I'm doing these kinds of talks for all of them. Uh, but when we get back out to normal times, they also have star parties. So here on the North Shore, um, the Lake County Astronomical Society, uh, the Skokie Valley Amateur Astronomers, uh, the Northwest Suburban Astronomers are probably the three closest clubs to us. Uh, there's also a club in Racine who has an actual observatory. So that's about an hour north of the Chicago suburbs, and they also do regular observing at their observatory. So the amateur astronomy clubs are, are definitely a good possibility for that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Oh, uh, Bruce Rohner wants to know, sorry, Bruce, I gave you your last name. Um, are there other universes? Ah, so that is a very good question, and the answer is we don't know. <laughs> So I'm a theoretical physicist, which means I spend most of my days doing computers and math and stuff, and my training is in relativity. And the cross-section between relativity and cosmology um, is a place where we often uh, ask this question. 
Um, and so part of answering that question is something that we, that we can study. It's asking about what is the nature of our own universe? Is it infinite in extent? And is it open or is it closed uh, cosmologically? Um, and also, is it topologically closed? And so what I mean by that um, is if you were to imagine taking a piece of paper, okay, that if you just walk across the piece of paper, you can walk infinitely far and you just go on forever, no matter where you go. But a topologically closed object is like my water bottle. If I start walking on my water bottle, I'll go around my water bottle and eventually come back to my, where I started. Okay, globes like Venus behind me are also like that. And so one of the possibilities is that the universe is that way. If I set off in the universe that way and I go far enough, eventually I'll come back to where I started from the other side. Okay, so astronomers think about that and we can test that idea. And so far we've tested it and it's never convinced us that the universe is anything other than open. That is, I walk and then I just go on forever. But if it is closed, then the interesting possibility exists that, that the universe has weird structures and that our structure is maybe related to another structure. Maybe they're connected in weird ways through wormholes. Um, there's all kinds of interesting and strange possibilities that people think about. So um, I would say mathematically, absolutely, there could be other universes. Are they the same as our universe? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe the laws of physics are different there. Maybe the value of the speed of light is different there. Um, are they accessible from our universe? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, right? And so our job as theoretical physicists is we write down everything we know about our universe. We write down everything we know about possible external universes. And then we ask, what could you look for to either prove or disprove the existence of that alternate universe? And so far, there's nothing we can write down that we can observe that could disprove it. So we're still in this maybe, maybe not kind of phase that we're in. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it off after the next two questions because um, it's getting kind of late. So, um, uh, then this one is: Is it possible that the Earth's DNA arose as diaspora from another source in the universe? Yeah. So this is this is a really good question, and it's something that we think a lot about in astrobiology, particular in terms of the search for life here in the solar system. Okay, so, um, so the, the word that we usually use here is called panspermia. So the spreading of life from one world to the other. And the thing that really kind of, um, I mean, we've always kind of thought about this, but the thing that really convinced us that it's possible is that every year scientists go to Antarctica to look for meteorites because meteorites fall on the Antarctic ice and uh, they get preserved in the snow. Uh, but then when summer comes, the meteor is black and it melts all the snow around it. And when you're standing there looking at the vast ice field, you can say, oh, look, there's a rock. Uh, it must be a meteorite because this ice is 12,000 feet thick and it's you know, been here for, for eons. So in those searches, we have recovered many meteorites which came from Mars, right? So basically a big meteor hits Mars the way the meteor hit the Earth and killed the dinosaurs, that happened on Mars too. Chunks of Mars go flying out into the solar system, they go trekking across the solar system, and eventually they fall on Earth, okay? So, given that we know that life is very durable and can survive in very extreme uh, situations, it is completely plausible to us that bacteria on a meteorite could hitch a ride and make its way across the solar system and fall on another planet. And once you open up that possibility, there are two very big questions you have to ask. One is the question that was just asked. Did life in the solar system actually arise elsewhere and come to Earth? And we aren't actually from Earth. We're actually from somewhere else. And then the other question we have to ask is, when we find life elsewhere, maybe on the moon, maybe on Venus, maybe on Mars, maybe on Europa, did that life get there? from somewhere else in the solar system, in particular, maybe from Earth, right? So these are, these are the questions, right? The discovery of life is gonna be a monumental event in human history, okay? But then the work's still not done. There are gonna to be tons and tons of questions that we have to answer. And this question is, is probably one of the biggest ones, particularly here in our own solar system. 
yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay. Um, all right. Last question. What are black holes all about? Do they serve a purpose? <laughs> so black holes, of course they serve. The universe made them. They're doing something, right? So black holes, um, the black holes are probably one of the most interesting phenomena. Well, I did my PhD on black holes. So of course I'm going to say this, right? But, but they're one of the most interesting phenomena for the following reason is that everything in nature is governed by four fundamental forces. Okay. We have seen everything that we've seen in all the time that we've been studying the universe scientifically in laboratory experiments out in the solar system, you know, here on earth, whatever. And everything that we've ever seen, we can explain from these four fundamental forces, which we call the weak force, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. And the interesting thing about black holes is that black holes are a manifestation of the fact that despite the fact that gravity is the weakest of all of those forces, it is the dominant force in the universe because it's the thing that influences the universe on the largest scales. It's the thing that holds galaxies together and is influencing and driving cosmology. But it's also able to be so strong that it creates an object like a black hole that no other phenomena in the universe can get away from. Okay, and that's remarkable. You're the weakest, but you're the strongest. And that kind of cognitive dissonance that we have about gravity is one of the reasons that all of us are so interested. And black holes make a perfect laboratory, both in terms of astronomy and in terms of theory, to really kind of wrap, try and wrap our brain and wrap our understanding around that, around that question about gravity. So, so they're really interesting from that viewpoint. And we can talk about the astrophysics of them um, again sometime in the future. We've done one of those talks before, but uh, we can certainly come back to them sometime if you want to check them again. Okay. Well, um, I'm sure the, the questions could keep pouring in, but, um, but uh, Shane did, did offer to answer some of your questions by email, um, which is awfully nice of him. So if you have further questions, um, you know where to turn. Can you, can you give that email address again? Yeah, so, uh, well, you can find me if you just go to the Northwestern Sierra page. I'm in the directory there, but it's s.larson, don't forget the dot, and larson with a no, at northwestern.edu. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, uh, you've for the certainly taken us. You've taken us very far out of our COVID bubbles. <laughs> we do our best. Take care, everyone. Be safe. We'll do it again sometime. Thank you. Good night.